what is it? What is this thing called? According to Vedic literature, karma is essentially the law of cause and effect, which we believe uh, runs the world. The science depends on, on the regularity of cause and effect. Things happen for reasons. On account of A, B, on account of B, and so on. So we, we accept that there's cause and effect, but the Vedic literature takes it further and says that cause and effect extends over multiple lifetimes. And what are those lifetimes? The, the first understanding is uh, that the body which is supposedly living is not myself. Yantra Rudkani Maya in Bhagavad Gita says the body is like a car. And you, you drive around for a while. But the driver and the car are not identical. Hmm? Even um, we may speak of them as, as, as if identical. We see a car go by and say, there goes the president. We just saw it because, you know, a Mercedes or something. But, so we sometimes identify the car with the person in the car. But when we're being careful, we'll say, there's two things there. There's the vehicle and the person in the vehicle. So this body is of the same nature. I'm thinking I'm American, I'm thinking I'm 18 or 20 or 40 or 70. I'm thinking I'm white, I'm black, I'm this, I'm that. Those are all labels for the car. But I'm different from the car, I'm perceiving the car. I'm conscious of what's going on with the body. But the, the knower of the body is different from the body. I, I know about this, something about this table just by seeing it, it's gray and black, it's plastic and steel. So the, the table is one thing and another thing. I perceive the table. So I perceive my body also. I have a, one of my colleagues who was a mathematician analyzed, just take the sense of sight, the seeing, there's an object, a camera here, and we say, I see the, the camera. But who is that I that's seen? You know, what's happening when we say, well, light is entering through the, the lens of the eye and being focused on the retina. And certainly that the, the eye of the scene, although we say, you know, what my eyes can see, I see with my own eyes, with my own eyes. The eye is an instrument. Pieces of it get replaced. When you get old enough, they'll, they'll swap out your lens. And there's other parts they can swap out also. It's a machine. So you say, well, I'm not my eye. Well, the light then hits the, the, the retina and it gets turned into electrical impulses which travel down the optic nerve. And we probably don't think, well, the, the seer is the optic nerve. We're using the optic nerve. Well, then you go to the brain and there's a particular section where uh, the dendrites are lighting up and all of that. So, and, and what's happening? Well, there's a difference in, in the electrical input that's going from this level to that level. And is, is that who I am? Is that the perceiver of, of the camera? A collection of, of dendrites and so on? And if you go down below that level, 
you get to the cells. And the cells are these little um, bits. And is that what I am, just a collection of cells? The cells actually get replaced regularly. That's part of the process of biological existence. They, they get old and wear out and get replaced. So even if we think, if, even if we go to the cellular level or the, the level of the brain, intuitively I feel that that's not me. I am seeing. I am perceiving. And I'm different from this machinery. In philosophy of science, this has been referred to as the hard problem of consciousness. Have you heard that term before, the hard problem of consciousness? Yeah. It's a hard problem for science because they can't grab it. It's hard to explain consciousness by any physical process or even mathematically to explain what consciousness is. There's something like, there's something that it feels like to see red or to be hungry. And that's not something we can reproduce in, with artificial intelligence of machinery. So all this goes to the point that the body and the self are different. Consciousness and the body are different. In the Bhagavad Gita, the, the body is called the field of activities. And the self is called the knower of the field. So, when it comes to who I am, I'm not American, I'm not 20 or 70, I'm not white or black, I'm consciousness. I'm a spark, a unit of consciousness who experiences the, the pains and pleasures of this body, who experiences what it's like to be in the OSU at 7.30 in the evening on 25th. 24th of September. And that conscious self travels in this lifetime. Kamaram Jagannam Jala. From the body of a child to the body of a young person, the body of an old person. The body, we're changing from one body to the next. I once had a body more closely resembling yours <laughs> quite a long time ago. But I can't get it back. That body is gone. Now I have an old man's body. But I'm the same person. I remember when I was in the, in the university buildings, when I was doing the things that students do. I don't remember, and every one of us is an individual unit of consciousness. You know what you have for, had for breakfast this morning. She doesn't know what you had for breakfast this morning. Because you're one person, she's another person. Individual units of consciousness. I don't remember your childhood, I remember my childhood. Because I'm the same conscious person. I remember when I was climbing trees and, uh, and rooftops. So that conscious being, that conscious unit is traveling from body to body, even in our own immediate experience. And the Tade Hunter of Bhakti. And the moment when we leave this body is called death. The spark of consciousness is described in the Bhagavad Gita 
it, it can't be cut, it can't be dried, it can't be burned, it can't be blown away, it can't be drowned. It's impervious to material forces. It's always existing. As matter exists temporarily, you know, there's tables here today and gone tomorrow. Consciousness exists permanently. My body is here today, gone tomorrow, but consciousness exists permanently. So now it's here, later it will be somewhere else. Now it's in this body, it will be in a different body. We don't see the how it's moving from one to the next. But it is, just that I walked in the room, you have no idea where I was before I walked in. But I was somewhere. <laughs> and when I leave, I'll be somewhere else. I wouldn't just go poof and then dissolve because you don't see me anymore. I keep going. But according to the Bhagavad Gita, we keep going. Going where? From one life to the next life. The consciousness is transferred from the old and useless body or smashed up body, whatever has happened to it, and put in the seed of the next body. And which body? There's a lot of them out there. All sorts of shapes and forms and colors, and, uh, gradations, species. So what, by what process is the selection made? How am I moved from one body to a particular body, a particular other body? That's common. That's karma. Again, what is karma? It's a reaction of previous actions. According to my, my lifetime, the, the total, sum total of my lifetime, I'm making my next life. Now you're in college, you're preparing for your career. And what sort of career you get will have a relationship with what you've done here. If you spent your whole time here partying it up and uh, blowing your exams, it doesn't look very well, doesn't look very good for your, your next stage. And if you're focused, your stellar performance and all of that, then on to higher education or on to uh, you know, corporations fighting to hire you, according to what we did in this time. Even, you know, I overeat this morning and then I have a stomach ache this afternoon. What we do now has an effect on what happens to us later. I mean, this is not difficult to follow. The only thing that's new is that it extends for more than one lifetime. It doesn't stop at the border and say, okay, it's all over. It crosses that border to the next. What we do now determines where we go next. That's common. What I do now determines what happens later. Even me, you know, I put my hand in the fire, I get burned. That's karma. I do something and something happens. You know, I, I, I do some good deed and uh, you know, I return someone's wallet and it turns out she was the, you know, the heir to the Astor fortune and she thanks me with a $10,000 check. Whatever it is. And karma is complex, because our lives are complex. So complex that no one can really figure it out. 
the aggregate number of things that we do in the course of a day, what to speak of a life, is infinitely complex. And the outcome of all these complexities is that we're taking uh, birth in a sunset yoni from the sea, higher and lower species, and again and again and again. Sometimes born as a human being, sometimes a fish, sometimes a tortoise, sometimes an eagle, on and on and on, and there's a tree. And it's endless. We go on and on with the results of our karma. See that you get simplified. We go on and on with the results of our karma. Uh, until one is freed from this cycle, until one is freed from this cycle of birth and death. So that freedom comes by spiritual realization, by Krishna consciousness. When the spark of consciousness within the body transcends the bodily platform, and resumes its real identity. When I give up this false identity, and I come to my real identity in relationship to the Supreme or in relationship to Krishna, that brings me to this platform of liberation from the cycle of birth and death. And then there's so much more to talk about what happens at liberation. It's uh, what is our life like after that, but that's a, more than we'll cover in the next 10 minutes. <laughs> so I'll stop here and see what kind of thoughts or questions you might like to raise. Yes? So as you said that uh, whatever we do, we get results for that later. Sometimes we do a lot, but we sometimes we fail uh, on a later stage. So sometimes. We, sometimes we, even if we work hard, we fail. Yeah, because it's not exactly in our hand. Sometimes you have the best doctor and a mild disease, and you die. And sometimes the patient is, is you know, severely, critically ill, and there's, there's no doctor to be found, and he lives. So these things are not entirely within our control. We're struggling here to control what's going on by scientific knowledge, by social networks, by who we know and, and what we have, by power, by wealth, by smarts. Somehow or other, we need to get on top of all this so that things don't go off the rails and so that I can have things go the way I'd like them to go, reasonably speaking. But it, it refu nature refuses to be, become under our control. This is the essential problem of life in this world. We want to be controllers of matter, controllers of the environment, controllers of what goes on in our life. And it's not under our control. Nature is more powerful than we are. If you accept that there's God, then nature is running under the direction of God. If you don't accept that there's God, nature on its own is more powerful than we are. how nature could be so powerful without higher input, that's, again, more than we'll do in 10 minutes. But either way, we're under control. We're trying to stay on top of things, but really we're just trying to stay afloat. And sometimes we are, and sometimes we're under. So, Happiness in this world is something like the happiness of the man on the dunking stool. You know, he's like dunked under and 
kept under. And then they bring him up. <gasps> and they flip it again. So the, the great enjoyments of this world, they, they're, <gasps> they're interludes between the, being under. This is the, the way it is. We could paint it beautiful and say, oh, life is, doesn't work that way. A person who's thoughtful, and which of us doesn't want to be thoughtful? And to keep in mind that this is a world where there's, there's birth, there's death, there's old age, there's disease. That's what we're living with, all of it. Why are we all masked up here? Birth, death, disease, and this. And so the question, what are we going to do about it? Not what am I going to do about a particular disease? What am I going to do about COVID-19? What am I going to do about diphtheria? What am I going to do about the fact that I don't want to get old, I don't want to get diseased, I don't want to die, I don't want to have to go through the whole thing again. And yet I'm forced. What am I going to do about that? That's the problem of human life. That's the issue of human life. Anything else, anything less than that is, is a fudge. It's a wash. It's a refusal to, to face the actual issue. Oh, we put that aside, you know, like, we can't deal with that right now, meaning we can't deal with it at all, ever. And so we put it aside. That's chicken. Cowardice. Intellectual cowardice. These are the issues. Whether you're Stephen Hawkins or, or Bub, these are the issues that we all have to deal with. Yeah, was there another question? So, Maharaj, you said uh, whatever action seems biggest of the action, either in this life or next life. Either this life or next life, there'll be a result for what we do, yeah. Yeah, so how one should lead the present life to go higher in terms of spiritual? Well, what, how do we lead in such, live in such a way that we go higher than this? entanglement in actions and reactions. We're advised that we should connect ourselves not with, have to anchor ourselves not to the, the material world, the world of, of our bodies, but to the world of consciousness and the world of the Supreme Consciousness or Krishna. When we do that, we get free from action and reaction. When we surrender to Krishna, Krishna means the Supreme Consciousness. Why should I? I'm superior to batter. Am I not? You know, I tell my hands, come on, scratch my head, and it does. <laughs> so I'm at least nominally in charge here. My hand can't, my eyes can't see anything, but I can see. Consciousness is superior to matter. It's consciousness that's created this, this room. Not that the glass and steel and plastic all said, let's be a room. <laughs> and so architects and engineers and, and guys with money came together and said, this is what we want, here's how we want it. That means consciousness created the, the room. Consciousness is moving the cars. Consciousness is programming the computers. So the, the platform of consciousness is the superior platform. And when we're on that platform, then there's the platform of the supreme consciousness, the highest consciousness, the ultimate consciousness, with which we want to connect. That connection is called bhakti. That 
again in more than 10 minutes. We have our book, our Bhagavad Gita as it is. My book is there, uh, show and tell in, in the, yeah. There's the bag in the back, and in the bag is the book. <laughs> Authors are supposed to show their stuff. <laughs> That's the one. Just hold it up for the world to see. So these issues are dealt with also in my book, which is available from Amazon.com. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Um, so my question is, um, you said that you know some, when we do something, which is considered as bad, it means that considered. Bad, it is considered as bad, like you know, harming someone unnecessarily or. It gets difficult. We want to act in such a way that we do no harm, that we do good that the reactions or results of our activities will be good for us and good for others, not bad. But it's complicated. And partly it's complicated because we're operating in ignorance. We're not operating from a platform of full knowledge. We, we, we're operating from a platform of not really knowing, to, to begin with, who I am. and what this world is and how it works and what the results of the things I do will be for others. Uh, I, I visit Bengal sometimes on the eastern coast of India, which um, has been the victim of the worst man-made environmental disaster that I know of in this way, that they had, they had sort of mm, shallow pools of water and it's part of their agricultural environment and the way things are in the tropical area and these shallow pools of water and there was an initiative let's drain these shallow pools and provide water for people from deep wells <laughs> deep wells so that we can get pure water and people will no longer be afflicted by waterborne diseases, by malaria, or by you know, some of the things. Good, right? Only thing is, they dug down, you know, deep into the water table and all of that, uh, down to the level where there was arsenic. And you have just enormous spread of arsenic poisoning. I'm trying to do something good, but because I'm in ignorance, the result comes out bad. When they liberated the concentration camps in, in Germany, the Americans came in and liberated the camps. And they saw these, you know, emaciated prisoners and felt such compassion that they were, you know, tossing out their G rations, you know, their their cans of, of whatever it was they had, the, the, the food that they traveled with. They just you know tossed it to these to these you know, starving people. And the doctors among those starving people said, don't take it. You haven't been eating, you can't digest it. And people who'd survived all the way to the liberation of the camps died from the charity of the American soldiers. Who you know, couldn't be expected to know. So even when we try to do good, when we're in ignorance, it sometimes turns out bad. To say nothing of when we're really out to do something evil. 
Which even when I'm doing it, I'm thinking it's somehow good. <laughs> Al Capone uh, was quoted as saying, you know, why are they so against me? I just tried to give the people of Chicago a good point. My point is just that it, it's like a swamp. Nobody knows how to drain, drain it. The laws of karma are so intricate, so complex, and our knowledge of how things work is so limited. Yeah, we create our own, we poison our own environment. That's the, the present truth. Therefore, the, the, the Bhagavad Gita says, don't, don't even try. Yes, you should try. Try to be, to act good, try to act as some, and there are some guidelines for that. But that alone doesn't solve our problem. It's better, yes. But it doesn't solve the problem. Because it's still on the material level. Materially good as against materially bad. But good or bad materially is all bad. You know, which disease would you like? Well, the lesser one. Oh, that's good. <laughs> so again, it's, it's getting free from the bodily conception of life understanding my spiritual nature and connecting with Krishna or the supreme spiritual truth. That frees me from all past karmic reaction and that gives me liberation. Again, that's a quick story. Another question? Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. I actually have two questions. One is of my own, other is someone else who can't be here asked me to ask you. That may not be on topic, but my question is about karma. So thank you for introducing this really important topic. I have heard and read stories of some souls being able to remember their past lives. Yeah. It's like very rare, but how does that work and why isn't everybody? The There are accounts of, of children, for example, who, who remember or appear to remember their past lives. The premier researcher on the subject was the late Ian Stevenson of the University of Virginia, who's written quite a number of books on the subject, especially his, his, his work on reincarnation and birth defects. A massive and interesting study. How that happens, it's rare, as you say, and it's almost like, what would you say, uh, something that's, well, it's against the usual laws of nature. Usually, you forget. But sometimes, you know, like a loophole in the laws, someone remembers. And some of the cases are quite impressive. And I, I don't have time, although I've written in articles about this. They're on my website, jaiswami.info. Um, but there are like loopholes in the laws of nature. There, or, you know, what would you say? Things that don't usually happen, but sometimes happen. And they, they're evidentially quite interesting. And if you think about it, and Dr. Stevenson has brought up this point, why is it that people, some people have a particular skill or a particular taste or particular phobias or particular philias? Why? A particular disposition to this or that. You know, anybody could have been Mozart. Why was it this person? How is it that he was able to compose symphonies at, you know, before he was a teenager? And there, there are many editions of it. I know there was a, a movie about reincarnation that was done some time ago, a, a dramatic sort of thing, came from a book. Uh, we knew, no, I didn't know him for 
this may have been my college day. I think he was the producer of the film. His interest came about because he was uh, lounging around with his wife, I think, on their extensive uh, Los Angeles Hollywood kind of property. And they heard ragtime music coming from, the, from their house. And he thought, you know, what's that all about? And he went into his home, and his little son was sitting at, at the piano playing ragtime music. And the kid had no instruction in the piano, never done anything on the piano, and he's sitting there playing sophisticated, you know, scratch up with kind of uh, rag. And where did you learn that? Oh, I just know how to do it. I just know how to do it. So there are children with unusual skills. There are children with unusual memories which correlate upon research with the lives of a previous person. To make things more interesting, there are instances where along with such memories, the child has certain birth marks or, or birth defects, often exceedingly rare, that correspond in some way to markings on the life of the person whose life he seems to remember. So science doesn't really deserve to ignore this. They have to, ought to look at it and say, what's going on? And sometimes like to do and say, you know, they've got like cheap and easy ways to dismiss it. But if you really look at, at what's going on, it, it takes more than a cheap and easy explanation. And apart from that, it's, it's meant to provoke our thoughts. It's meant to provoke our thoughts. So generally we forget, but even if I, you know, who remembers being in the womb? And who wasn't there? So forgetfulness is the norm. We shouldn't be surprised that I don't remember my previous life. And if I did remember all my previous lives, this life would be unbearable. You know, I mean, there's so much from my you know, younger life that I, please let me forget it forever. And now I can have to remember all my previous lives and oh, no. But, this phenomenon is there and, and points to, again, the difference between the body and consciousness, the persistence of consciousness from one lifetime to the next. All of these things which are discussed in the Bhagavad Gita. Do we have a, I think in the same bag there's a copy of Bhagavad Gita written in the show and tell the record. Not in that little, yeah, in the bigger bag. Maybe there is. Otherwise, I would get to show up with my ebook readers. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe not. Okay. But it is there. Along with, we publish. I, I used to work with our publishing company, published a lot of books. So we have a lot for you to read. Your second question. Yeah, so that person asked me to ask you how to attract positivity in our life. <laughs> how do you create positivity? Interesting thought. My, my book, by the way, is, is, feels, is a commentary on the most negative book you might ever read in your life. <laughs> <laughs> Who here has read the, the biblical book of Ecclesiastes? Watch out. <laughs> it opens with the decla declaration that everything is meaningless. And then does a very good job of demonstrating it. So we've talked about that, and in fact, one of my friends in publishing said, you know, you can't live on negativity. So what is the positive message here? The positive message really is to go beyond both positive and negative. Because we want material positivity. We don't want starvation. We want abundance. We don't want Misery, we want happiness. We don't want 
injustice, we want justice. We don't want uh, ugliness, we want beauty. We don't want this, we want that. But they're two sides of the same coin. They go together. This is our project. We want happiness without misery. And guess what? Because I have this body, they come together. Yes, I'll get some happiness in this body. And I'll give some happiness to others. But I'll give lots of misery. And I'll endure a lot of misery. So your friend's question is, how do we get the good part? And it doesn't work that way. As long as we're on the material platform, sometimes we'll get lots of good. And you see people, you know, it looks like their life is just like full of all the good stuff. And you know, often it's because we don't see the other part of what's going on in their life. Or we're not looking ahead to what's going to happen in their next life. You know, this life I'm king of uh, you know, my reign, and next life I'm a dog. And it goes on and on. You know, sometimes up, sometimes down. So the point is not to try to somehow get the good part. That's, that's the project, how to get the good part before the bad part. The Vedic project is to rise above good and bad. To accept that something will be good, something will be bad. When it's good, it's good. When it's bad, it will be over soon or later. But that, abandon that project. The good will come anyway. Who stands in line to suffer? No one stands in line to suffer. And who suffers? Who here can say, I, I never suffered? <laughs> it comes of its own accord, doesn't it? Well, if misery comes of its own accord, why won't happiness come of its own accord? According to my karma, according to my past deeds, it'll come and so the ratio is already there. I'll get, you know, like mixing colors. I'll get this much of this, I'll get this much of that. It'll come on its own. Why do I have to struggle and, and perplex myself how to get a certain, you know, certain, by nature's arrangement, my necessities will come because I've got this body. And some happiness will come, and some misery will come. And why should I be preoccupied with only that? It's a waste of my intelligence. It's a waste of my human life. I should be thinking in this human life how to achieve spiritual understanding, how to understand the nature of myself as a conscious being, the nature of consciousness on the higher platform, consciousness, Krishna consciousness. That's the prerogative of human life. The, the parakeets, the dogs, the, the, the praying mantises, and so on. They can't say, why am I here anyway? What is my mission in life? What's my purpose? Why am I suffering? I don't want to suffer. That's for human beings. If we don't do that, then we're four-legged animals two-legged animals. So the animals eat and sleep and mate and fight. And if that's all we do, then we're two-legged animals doing the same things with greater sophistication. So human life means samajigyasa, inquiry about the Supreme, inquiry about our spiritual nature, inquiry, you know, of you know, these higher issues in life. Otherwise, what do you do? You know, I, I, I go to college, I become an engineer, I become a doctor, I become 
a psychologist, I become a musician, I become a television producer, and I get married and I, I have some kids and I buy a, you know, a house and have some cars and some computers and we take vacations in, in Florida or Fiji and we have a lot of pictures of this and that and we put them on Facebook and so many things and then we get old and then things sort of decline and then we die and then it's over. And that's our life. That's our human life. Human life is something better, far better, and more important. And it, it, the, the opportunity shouldn't be lost quickly because time starts moving faster than faster quickly for you to grab the opportunity for, for inquiry about ourselves and about the being that's the basic assumption. Picasso, now that I have this human life, I can inquire about spiritual realization. Yes? So, um, in my understanding, karma is like we kind of predestined. Excuse me? We, in for understanding of karma, is like we are predestined for certain, um, as you said, miseries and happiness. Yes. For the whole life. Yes. Is it predestined that we get spiritual inquiries? Or uh, that we is, is it, it's predetermined, as it were, that we'll get a certain amount of happiness and. Yeah. What about the spiritual? Or like, can we have, can we succeed? Like, yes. It, it is, is this just, you know, also scripted that if you take the spiritual realization, you'll succeed or fail or, yeah. or someplace in between according to your karma? No. no. This business goes beyond karma. This business goes beyond karma. Just as there's certain things that, you know, they happen on the ground, there's things that happen in the air, it's different. On the, the, the spiritual, of course, this is also, yes, there's some background. Some people are naturally interested in spiritual topics. Some people are naturally inquisitive, you know, why and why and why and why. Some people are naturally attracted the spiritual values or spiritual spiritual path. Why? Bhagavad Gita says, because in their previous life they cultivated that. And that's never lost. If I make a million dollars in this life, at the end of life, it's over, it's gone. If I become a PhD in this life, I don't get to carry my doctorate with me into the next. <laughs> But whatever you've, progress you've made spiritually, that's yours. So if you make 2% advancement in this life, you start from 2%. If you make 80%, you start from 80%. So there's, there's no, no loss, no, there's no diminution. It's a permanent gain. But it's not that if I didn't cultivate that, I can, I can never get started. And it's not that with whatever proportion I have, well, that's kind of where I'm going to be for the rest of it. No, you can make, there are, there are methods. Bhakti yoga means there's a, a process by which to advance. There was an earlier I heard as I came in, there was chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram. This vibration, this sound comes from the spiritual platform. So if I connect my mind to that sound, if I absorb my mind in that sound, I'm coming to that platform. That platform is beyond karma. So the process is how to live in such a way that I can always be on that platform. 
and there's a science for that. Not that you have to go to the Himalayas and uh, live in a cave. There, there are methods that one can learn. Also, I have a question. So, um, in right now, it's very popular to say that you can do, you can make anything in this world. Like everything is in your hand. You can oh, that's all baloney. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, create your own reality. Yeah. It's all up to you. Yeah. You you know, think and grow rich and all of this kind of stuff. It's gang. It's all bunk. It's not true. The author of Think and Grow Rich grew rich. And the millions of people who bought his book. <laughs> it's just, it, it, it presupposes that somehow or other we are in control or can be in control of nature. It's just a, a sort of a touchy-feely version of the same illusion. I can, be, I, can, I can win, I can grab it and, and, and succeed. Just all I need is the right attitude, the right mindset, the right feelings, the right... No. I have a friend, had a friend, he's late, um, high school friend, smart, good-looking, popular, Married a beautiful girl, and at the age of uh, 19 or 20, got into a car accident and was paralyzed for life. Had nothing to do with how he was thinking. Yeah, millions of examples. <laughs> On a corporate level, there was a, a, a company back in when I was younger. They had a, a, a mint, they, their product was a mint. And their advertising was that it was both a breath mint and a, uh, a digestive mint. Or something. <laughs> and, you know, they, they, they occupied the territory as far as mints go. They were the, when you thought of mints, you thought of them. They only ran into one problem. Their product was called AIDS. And when autoimmune deficiency syndrome took over, that was the end of their brand. It was irretrievable. <laughs> Nothing could be done. No amount of positive thinking <laughs> could rescue their investment. The company. We could all cite, I'm sure, you know, so many examples upon examples upon examples of things that just weren't in our control. Despite the most positive attitude, who, which one of us hasn't heard, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. <laughs> there's, a, there's a company, there's an amusing company, they make posters among other things, um, anti-motivational posters. <laughs> and one poster showed this athlete um, and sitting there with his head in his hands. And the, the, the caption said, failure. When you're best, just listen to that. <laughs> it happens. The, the Ecclesiastes is graphic about this. Um, like, like, I'm not going to read from something I wrote, but I should know it by heart, it's such a famous passage.
quite a famous um, Ecclesiastes, among other things, is, is a classic piece of literature. I turned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill, but time and chance happen to them all. Now, in a discussion of what we mean by time and chance, we have karma in there, which is a little more, a lot more precise than, than time and chance. But the point is, still holds. I know of an athlete, I briefly stumbled upon a headline somewhere. He was like a shoe in for the Olympic medal, and he missed his plane. Couldn't compete. I don't think he was just in traffic, you know, some sort of thing, he couldn't make it, and that was bad. How much control did he have? So it's all applesauce. Anyone who's feeding you that one is, is feeding you a lie. That it's all in your hands, it's all just whatever, if you just think the right way, the secret will take over. Rubbish. Something else? Hmm? Things are not in our control, as you say. Should we even try to improve ourselves because that things No. Are things are not in our control. Should we try to improve ourselves? No. <laughs> no, of course that's erratic. But no. We're dedicating our whole lives to self-improvement, self-improvement. What am I trying to improve? Some temporary situation. I, I improve myself to the maximum extent, and then I get run over by a truck. What's the point? The real improvement, again, is to become self-realized. That you can do in a moment. Or it may take lifetimes. But that's the project. That's the improvement, ultimate improvement. Not the penny ante improvement. You become president. What could be better than that? And then kick you out after four years. <laughs> I'm conscious that your time is is valuable to you, and I don't want to monopolize it, and I'm looking to you to tell me what to do. I can answer a question or two more if you want, or we can break, or what would you like to do? Are we'll be serving prasadam. I know they're going to be serving <laughs> prasadam. Would you like to that's, start that now? No, I mean, that's... Yeah, the that's next thing we, we know, planned. those who've been here before probably expect, and rightly so, that there will be <laughs> uh, refreshments afterwards. So either we can break for refreshments now, or um, I'll take a question. Do we have the room till nine o'clock? So. Oh, we go till nine. Yeah, we have till nine. We have this room until nine. We have this room until nine. So yeah, so our, our time is measured here. So while we can see on the uh, okay, so we can, uh, discuss on so we go into informal move uh, mode, and how are you going to serve? You can make a line. So what you might want to do is if you have questions, you might be what like be later on the line because not everyone on the line will be at the front of the line. Uh, for you. Yeah. And, also yeah. before you break. and if you like, um, I'll sit here and you know, come talk to me. Yeah. So before we break, um, you know, let's uh, give a big round of applause to his Just wanted to let you guys know that you know, despite of his uh, busy schedule and uh, 
is already diagnosed too late, but he still was kind enough to give his association to all of us here at OSU. What and amazing sacrifice. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, I want to, I really want to thank you all for you know, coming and participating and listening uh, to Maharaj. And if you have any questions, you know, what Maharaj said throughout his talk, and uh, if you would like to get more clarifications or if you have any other things that you would like to discuss and take from, you know, him, Feel free to join him. Uh, you know, grab your plates and yeah, eat it uh, and, um, and uh, like what Maharaj was explaining that you know we have to um, elevate you know ourselves from those, these material activities. So for that, every week we have two programs at OSU. One is in this room and the one is, is in the next room, the demo kitchen. So every Monday we uh, show you know a karma free vegetarian cooking workshop every Monday. And that includes uh, dinner at the end of the program. And also every Thursday, what Maharaj was saying, that you know, the, the mantra, Hare Krishna mantra, that's not material mantra, that's a transcendental mantra. So every Thursday, we practice that mantra every Thursday, 7 p.m. sharp in this room. So you know, if you'd like to uh, come and take a, take a look, experience you know, how that, that is. So Aiden is here uh, representing that. So please get in touch with him. And uh, we would really be happy to help you out, you know, in, in that journey. Uh, yeah, let's give one more a big round of applause. Yeah, and now please uh, have a vegan dinner. Take as much as you would like. Thank you all so much. Oh, it's great. Is he speaking Why do you put Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's my bush.